breaking news out of Greater Manchester um, of the police there and emergency services attending what they described as an incident. It was late on a Monday evening that worrying, confused reports started to come in. Report now from Greater Manchester Police, who are now saying that there have been uh, confirmed a number of fatalities. Twenty second of May, twenty seventeen, some kind of an incident at an Ariana Grande concert at the Manchester Arena. We now know that a single terrorist detonated his improvised explosive device near one of the exits of the venue deliberately choosing the time and place to cause maximum carnage and to kill and injure indiscriminately. The killer was Salman Abedi, 22 years old, British, of Libyan descent. In this suicide attack, he killed 22 people and injured hundreds more, many of them children. It was the deadliest terrorist attack since the 7-7 London bombings in 2005. How did no one managed to stop him. Six years on, an inquiry into just that has finally been published. I have found a significant missed opportunity to take action that might have prevented the attack. On Sunday, some of the victims' families announced they want more in their search for justice. Families of some of the 22 people who died in the Manchester Arena bombing say they want to take legal action against the security services for failing to protect their loved ones. You're listening to Stories of Our Times from The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm Luke Jones. Today, could someone have stopped the Manchester Arena bomber? I'm Fiona Hamilton, the Crime and Security Editor at The Times. This was the final report by Sir John Saunders, who was the chair of the public inquiry into the arena suicide bombing. Sir John's a retired High Court judge. He had a long experience actually trying terrorism cases, presiding over a number of high-profile terrorism cases. Mm. The public inquiry has been going for two and a half years. Sir John had already released two prior reports about the emergency response on the night of the bombing and the security uh, at the arena uh, leading up to the attack. And the key question in this third and final installment was, could the attack have been prevented? And it was really drilling down and looking at the actions of counterterrorism police and the security service in the years before the bombing. So, as you said, it's been two and a bit years in the making, this inquiry. We've had now this final part looking at the security services, and we'll get into that in a minute. But just remind us about parts one and part two. That was to do with security around the arena and then also the emergency response. Is that right? What did we find out from those two? There were two reports earlier that really catalogued pretty devastating failures in the security at the arena, not being good enough, staff not being trained enough. And on the night of the bomb in particular, that police officers didn't intercept and interrogate or stop Salman Abadi when he was walking around the facility, hunched over because of the weight of the giant bomb in his backpack. I have concluded that there were serious shortcomings in the security provided by those organisations which had responsibility for it, and also failings and mistakes by some individuals. And then shortly before Christmas, I covered the second report by Saunders into the immediate aftermath of the bomb and how emergency services responded. And there were a series of really serious errors that meant the response was nowhere near as effective as it should have been. We heard heartbreaking evidence of the injured and the rescuers who were in the city room, hearing the sirens of ambulances knowing paramedics were close by, expecting their imminent arrival, only for them not to arrive. Paramedics were sent to the scene. 
but didn't go into the city room foyer where the bomb exploded. The fire service didn't even turn up until the last seriously injured victims had been taken away because they mustered at a point three miles from the arena and the police failed to declare a major incident. It was that failure that really resulted in a complete lack of communication between emergency services on the night mm. and families of victims has have been very upset by those failures and that they left seriously injured people lying around waiting for help. And you've been immersed in all of this and have followed all of those twists from those first two parts. So when we had last week Sir John's final conclusions from this third part about what the security services were doing or were not doing, what did you make of his headline response? There was a realistic possibility that actionable intelligence could have been obtained which might have led to action preventing the attack. The reasons for this missed opportunity included a failure by the security service, in my view, to act swiftly enough. I think it was what we were expecting because we we knew that there was going to be criticism and the security services were very much braced for that criticism. I think what we got last week Uh, as Sir John Sanders detailed his report, was a a finer detail than we've ever had before about exactly what was known about Abadi. And it really crystallised the fact that had different steps been taken, that Mm. potentially the attack could have been prevented. Let's just rewind and and think about Salman Abadi himself then. He's of Libyan origin and this sort of Libyan diaspora that's in Manchester. Yes, so his parents travelled to Manchester and were asylum seekers. And he is part of a major Libyan diaspora in South Manchester. Lots of travel back and forth between Libya and the United Kingdom. And the really crucial moment that Sir John Saunders highlighted was in 2011 when Ramadan Abedi, his father, took Salman Abedi and his younger brother Hashem back to Libya. Now, Ramadan has always denied fighting in the conflict there and just said he went to give aid. But there were images of his sons in military fatigues and carrying weapons. And it's very clear that they certainly engaged in that conflict. They likely fought with an Islamist militia. And Sir John Saunders concluded that certainly that would have been a place where they were radicalised. I have concluded that there were a number of contributory factors to Salman Abedi's radicalisation his family background and his parents' extremist views, along with their participation in the struggle in Libya, played a significant part. One of the key lessons of the inquiry, Saunders said, is not to focus on one threat at the expense of another. And he found that MI5 had really put itself in a risky position in 2016, 2017, because they were so focused on the threat from Syria and the young men travelling to and potentially travelling back from Islamic State, that they effectively dropped the ball a bit on Libya. And even though an internal report at MI5 in 2010 had raised real concerns, there didn't seem to be the focus on young men returning from Libya. And Saunders raised that as a particular case where they had potentially dropped the ball. And this was while they were, what, young teenagers? Yes, young teenagers. They travelled back to Manchester and Abadi just seems to be surrounded by people who were radicalisers, suspected terrorists. I mean, he turned up on MI5's radar quite regularly over the years between 2014 and 2017 because he was what they call a second-tier contact of suspected terrorists. So he knew somebody who knew somebody who MI5 were interested in Mm. And sometimes he turned up directly. In particular, he was visiting a terrorist prisoner. And he also knew a lot of young men who travelled to Islamic State. And tell us, first of all, about that terrorist recruiter who, who was behind bars. And Salman Abedi was not just contacting him via telephone, but he was even going to visit him as well. This is a man called Abdul Rayos Abdullah. Now, he was paralysed uh, when he was shot in the back in the Libyan conflict. He was seen to be a major recruiter for ISIS in Manchester, and he's serving a jail sentence for that at the moment. 
when police arrested him in 2014, they uncovered a trance of messages on his phone, some text messages between him and a guy called Salman. Now, that was a baby. In the years following, when he was in prison on remand and then later after he had been sentenced for this terrorism offence, Abadi visited him. They were observed talking uh, by prison officers, although it's never been known what was said. And there was also an illicit phone, an illegal phone that Abdullah had when he was in custody. And the billing data ultimately showed that he had made 11 calls to Abadi in January or February 2017, so a few months before the bomb. But unfortunately, that billing data was not downloaded until after the attack. Mm. Now, Saunders concluded on Abdullah. It is likely, in my view, that he provided support for Salman Abedi's ideological beliefs and increased Salman Abedi's resolve to carry out the attack. But not that he knew that Abedi was planning this attack. But you had him behind bars, a sort of known radicaliser who Abedi was talking to, and also somebody who later went to travel to be part of IS. Raphael Hosti, he achieved notoriety. He was known as the, the baby-faced terrorist, and he travelled to Syria, and he actually became a major propagandist for Islamic State, and he was taken out in a drone strike. The, the Saunders report says that the families knew each other, and Abadi is very likely to have known Hosti. And then there was a, a third crucial person likely to be a radicalising influencer. This is a preacher who died a couple of months before the bombing. His name is Mansour al anisi and he was a Libyan as well. He had lived in Manchester, and he went down to Plymouth, and he had been long suspected of being a radicalizer by MI5, and he was actually suspected of influencing another young convert who tried to blow themselves up about 10 years before mm. a Bailey's attack, although no one else was injured in that incident. And before we even get to the idea of, of trying to foil some attack that, that Salman Abedi is planning, with all of this that you're describing, mixing with these kind of people as a young teen, going with his father to Libya to possibly fight, why was he not going through the, the normal channels that people in that position are when there's concern about them being radicalised, things like prevent? So Saunders cited a radicalisation expert who said, if you think about radicalisation as a Petri dish. He said, I have never seen such a complete picture of the Petri dish absolutely brimming with germs. Because he had influences of radicalisation across his life, from his family to his friendship groups and to other peers. And then he was also affected by what Saunders described as noxious absences, which was a lot of parental absence and also a lot of absence from mainstream education. So this was somebody who was going along a very clear path to radicalization, and yet it was never picked up by any of the institutions that he was coming across. The government's response to the risks of radicalization is the PREVENT programme. I have looked in detail at the various occasions when Salman Abedi could have been referred to PREVENT. I have concluded that he should have been. Saunders picked up two clear opportunities in which he was seen mixing with radicalizers and potentially at that point should have been referred to prevent. We don't know fully why that happened and we don't know whether it would have had an impact because he would have had to have engaged, but that was a missed opportunity. Saunders was also concerned about the fact that he wasn't turning up to school and later university and that that didn't really seem to come on anybody's radar one of his teachers had seen a picture of him with a weapon in Libya and he'd said that family friends had a property and he was out shooting and so nothing more was done about that and that was accepted. Saunders didn't place any blame at all on the schools and the education system, but he said perhaps there needs to be a better system to flag up incidents like that. So, you know, you've taken us through all these various ways that Salman Abedi was a person that the security services should be concerned about. You explained for us how he was going back to Libya, possibly fought in Libya as a young teenager, was photographed with guns, that he had all these connections to 
terrorist influencers, some behind bars, some who went to go and, and join IS. There were all these ways in which Salman Abedi should have turned up on the security services radar. But most concerning for this inquiry are the two bits of intelligence that were not properly handled in the build-up to the attack on Manchester Arena. In the months before the arena bombing, MI5 received two pieces of intelligence and Saunders highlighted this as the clear principal missed opportunity to stop Abadie. Now, I can't tell you what those pieces of intelligence were because citing national security reasons, we've been told that will be never made public. They were certainly received by intelligence officers. They were looked at by intelligence officers. Had they been treated differently, Abadie's trip back to the UK because he was in Libya for about a month until four days before the bombing, mm. that trip back from Libya would have been treated very differently and potentially very seriously. And Saunders goes on to say, had they treated him seriously, he could have been stopped at the airport and subjected to a counterterrorism check. That gives the police at the airport quite wide-ranging powers of interrogation. So they might have discovered something on his person that would have flagged him up as a concern. In fact, Saunders believes it's highly likely at that point he had procured the switch he used in the bomb in Libya and he was probably carrying it when he went through the airport. And he went on to say even if they hadn't stopped and interrogated him at that point, perhaps they would have followed him and put him under surveillance. And had they done that, they would have likely followed him to a recently purchased Nissan micro vehicle where he was storing the explosives for the attack. And in terms of how all of this was handled, Saunders picks out, is it one MI5 officer who felt there was something, there's a pressing national security concern but they sort of sat on it. Yes, he criticised an MI5 officer who believed one of the pieces of intelligence was potentially a pressing national security concern, but that person did not write a report on it the same day. And Saunders made the point that in national security issues, if you think something is concerning, you should really step on it and act quickly. Now, the intelligence was discussed after that point with other officers and their assessment of it was not that it was of that pressing security concern and so it wasn't acted upon in the way that, that Saunders described it should have been. And of course, Abadi went through that airport, he collected his explosives, he and his brother put the bomb together and then he was able to carry out his attack. The terrorist attack at the Manchester Arena was a terrible tragedy. So we've had a, a completely unprecedented apology from Ken McCallum, who was the Director General of MI5. Gathering covert intelligence is difficult. But had we managed to seize the slim chance we had, those impacted might not have experienced such appalling loss and trauma. I am profoundly sorry that MI5 did not prevent the attack. We've never seen that before from the top spy mm. at Thames House. In fact, I was looking back because in 2017, the Manchester Arena was one of five terrorism attacks that year. And there was a independent report by David Anderson, then the QC, who was the terrorism legislation reviewer. And he raised similar concerns about whether the attack could have been prevented and about these two pieces of intelligence specifically. And at that point, MI5 said they didn't believe that had they done anything differently, the bomb would have been stopped. So it's been quite interesting to see the process mm. of public inquiry, the extra detail that Saunders has been able to flesh out, albeit behind closed doors. He really has pursued extra details about what was done and what wasn't done. And that has resulted in this admission by MI5 and its apology. And the MI5 boss apologising and expressing regret for what? For their judgment about what they did with that intelligence or regretting the situation, as some have sort of said in the past, where they don't necessarily have the resources to pursue all of these pieces of intelligence and persons of interest? It was an apology in two parts. And the first related to the specific intelligence that he regretted that they hadn't 
acted on that. And then he generically said he was profoundly sorry that they weren't able to stop the bomb. But it's not an issue of resourcing. That certainly wasn't brought up by him in his statement last week. It's absolutely true that in 2017, there was a very, very steady uptick in terrorism issues. Islamic State had declared its caliphate. It was running a a highly successful propaganda campaign that was attracting hundreds of young Britons to go and fight in Syria and Iraq. And there was real concern about people who were returning and posing a risk. There'd been a string of plots in the year before Manchester. MI5, at the point of that attack, was running about 500 investigations into Islamist terrorism. There were 3,000 active subjects of interest. So they were people actively on the radar. And there was another about 40,000 people, including a baby, who had been on that radar and then were considered uh, not a danger anymore, but they they had been a danger at some point. So that is a huge workload. There have been discussions about resources. And of course, resources are only finite and it, it takes a heck of a lot of resources to follow just a single person to be aware of everything that they're doing at any given time. However, it was quite a crucial point that that Saunders said, even though an MI5 officer in the Northwest team had said they were struggling to cope with the workload and that they had feared something terrible might happen as a result of that, the judge concluded there was no evidence that resource pressure was a reason for a specific missed opportunity. So we must Mm. take from that that it was less about resource and more about the judgment of the intelligence that they had. And of course, this final part of the inquiry, as you've laid out for us, has taken us into exactly what happened in so much clearer detail than we ever had before. But as you also referenced, it's not the full picture. A lot of this evidence was given in closed sessions, The public couldn't see it. You couldn't see it. The families couldn't see it. Even the family's lawyers couldn't necessarily hear what some of these MI5 officers were testifying. Do you think that that will hold back the level of accountability we can expect on the other side of this? So the way it worked was that a handful of MI5 and counterterrorism policing witnesses gave evidence behind closed doors Closed hearings, I am convinced, were entirely necessary as part of this inquiry if it was going to achieve its aims. The consequence of that, however, is that I have not been able to reveal some of the evidence on which my findings are based, as to do so would have risked breaching national security. And this goes to the heart of of issues such as methodology. Mm. So they don't want the public to know exactly how they're surveilling people, exactly what their online techniques are, and those sorts of issues. But he did give a a so-called gist, a summary of the evidence, which was read into the public record, and that concerned a lot of things we talked about and the number of times that Abadi was on the radar. I think that in terms of accountability, these sorts of issues are very keenly felt at the security service. The people who work there do have a genuine wish to stop attacks like the Mm. Manchester Arena. And so I think that surely we have to presume that there have been new measures put in place that will stop something like this happening again, that will mean that in future decisions would be taken differently. And one of the crucial things that we do know about is that there were real concerns raised about intelligence sharing between police and MI5 because there had been a failure to share some information about evading. And they've now opened up a joint counterterrorism centre in West London where investigators from those two organisations and actually other relevant institutions and agencies sit side by side to try and improve that information sharing. And so there are all these lessons then for the security services and counterterrorism police. Still at the middle of this, we've got so many grieving families who, even outside the magistrate's court last week after, after the report was published, we were visibly still furious, not just at Abadi and people who helped him and radicalised him, but also at the police and the security services and their failures. Going forward, is it clear what what the families want? We got a real range of views from the families last week, but there was certainly a very clear theme of being let down by the authorities. 
All we as families have asked for from day one is the truth, acknowledgement of failures and a determination to make sure that those failures are fixed. We have sat through eight weeks in the Old Bailey and over two years here at the inquiry. We have read countless statements, listened to hours of evidence, and we can only hope that one day the whole truth will come out. I mean, they were let down before, during and after the attack because the security at the arena wasn't good enough. The emergency response wasn't good enough. And now we found out that there were intelligence failings that really could have meant that the attack was prevented. So there's a feeling of devastation amongst those families. And it's an agonizing question for them, isn't it? What if? What if things were done differently? Would their loved ones still be alive? That's a really hard thing for them to have to countenance. Forgiveness will never be an option for such evil intentions and those that played any part in the murder of our children will never ever get forgiveness from top to bottom, MI5 to the associates of the attacker. We will always believe that you all played a part in the murder of our children. And on Sunday, Andrew Roussos, the father of the youngest victim, Safi, who was just eight years old when she died, announced that he plans to sue MI5 in their role over this. He indicated that other families were willing to join him as well if the legal action goes ahead. For the first time ever, MI5 come on TV and apologise. Why, why now come on TV only a few days ago and apologise? Why haven't you apologised from day one? Does that apology help you in any way? Not at all, no. If, I, I can't accept apologies for losing Safi. I, I, I want Safi back in my life and I can't have that. So an apology for missing 22 opportunities to stop the attacker. How, how can I accept an apology? For me, there was a real sense of deja vu in a lot of this because I covered the inquest into the July 7 bombing mm. in 2005. And what that inquest process really underlined was, yes, there were opportunities where the suicide bombers were on MI5's radar, but particularly failures in the emergency response and crucial failures to communicate. And that was in 2005. And then you fast forward to 2017, and a lot of those mistakes were repeated again, which is pretty devastating, really. And and I think if you go through these lengthy processes of inquiries or inquests and families relive experiences and survivors relive experiences and authorities promise to learn lessons, they really have to learn those lessons. And history shows that they haven't. And I suppose that's my concern that were another incident to happen in another major city mm. in the UK, would we see the same mistakes again mm. or would they be prepared? Is there also a suggestion that there needs to be a change in the law in terms of how we classify extremism and when that becomes a crime? Yeah, so this is a really, really tricky issue. A couple of years ago, Sir Mark Rowley, who was then the former head of counterterrorism, mm. and has now become the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, he was working in the private sector and he was asked to do a report with the then Commissioner for Countering Extremism, Sarah Khan. And they had a look into this very difficult issue of radicalizers and influencers who don't go on to commit terrorist attacks, but potentially influence the people who do. And they recommended that a new definition of hateful extremism should be created and that people should be prosecuted for it and it would close that gap in the law. The government took a look at that issue and it was abandoned. And my understanding is because getting a definition of hateful extremism is very difficult and there were concerns about freedom of speech and where you draw the line. 
So that was kicked into the long grass, as it were. Now, Sir John Saunders has raised it again in his report. He says that when you look at Abadi's life and the radicalizers around him, who won't be brought to justice for this attack, uh, it's perhaps something that needs to be looked at again, and he's urged the government to do that. In terms of the justice that could still be done, Salman Abadi killed himself in the bombing. His younger brother, Hashem, is serving a minimum of 55 years in prison in the UK. But there's his older brother, who refused to cooperate with the inquiry. Yeah, it feels like there are some pretty serious unanswered questions. In the case of Ishmael Abadi, the bomber's older brother, there's a warrant out for his arrest because he refused to engage in the public inquiry and answer questions. And he then went back to Libya. And Sir John Saunders raised that in his report and wondered whether there could be some steps taken that when someone is due to be a witness of the inquiry, that their passport is taken away from them to make sure that they do attend uh, or some other punitive measures to make sure they can't leave. And then, of course, while MI5 had always insisted that it was their conclusion that Salman and Hashim Abadi acted alone, Sir John Saunders came to a different conclusion. He believes that there was a mystery associate or associates in Libya who absolutely helped the brothers learn how to build a bomb and that probably trained them in counter-surveillance techniques because they were very clever and very careful. And he said very bluntly he does not credit them with the intelligence to be able to do all of that and that he believes somebody in Libya was helping. But as to who that is, if we do not know, and I'm not afraid, I'm not sure we ever will. You've been listening to Stories of Our Times, a podcast brought to you thanks to subscribers of The Times and The Sunday Times, with me, Luke Jones, and my guest, crime and security editor for The Times, Fiona Hamilton. If you're a subscriber, you can read all of Fiona's reporting on the Manchester Inquiry, on the work of the security services, on the police and more at thetimes.co.uk. The producers were Sam Chantarasek and Edward Drummond. The executive producers today were James Shield and Kate Ford and sound design was by David Crackles. If you can, please leave us a review. A nice one, if you wouldn't mind. It helps other people find us. Goodbye.